Hello, this is Stuart, Hear Me, See Me podcast, and today I've got an absolute legend with me. I've, I'm talking to one of my hair, hair idols. Uh, today I'm talking to Mr. Sam at night. How are you, sir? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, no, it's, a, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, we, we did just say about if we've ever met, and it's one of those odd things that we haven't met, but I just feel like I know you so well through your work. Um, We've got lots of people in common that we do know, but this is the wonderful thing about this is if there's one thing in lockdown that we're managing to do is reach out to people that we've never met and, you know, make contact. And... Well, we've finally got time to do stuff, haven't yeah. we? Well, I have anyway. Yeah, well, that's the only reason I was managing to pin you down, I think. You're a very, yeah. very yeah. good man. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I want to go straight into it. Um, I would think anyone, everyone know that, like, watching or listening, knows you uh but just just you know to go back i'm always quite interested at the early start start of the journey so can you tell me a little about when when you were young and when what took you into hairdressing god when i was young that was quite a while ago um no i've got quite good memory still thank god um i was i was brought up in i was born and brought up in a very small mining community in in up in the hills in the southwest of scotland um and, and my mum is still going, she's still there. And um, it, it, was, it was a very sort of happy, idyllic childhood, very poor. It was a, basically a council, council estate in the country, like there are many of them, you know, before um, Mrs. Thatcher decimated them. And, um, you know, we we're, were pretty much an outdoors childhood. Yeah. And then, it kept, when I left school, I, I mean, before I left school, we didn't have any money. So, but we never really thought of ourselves as poor because we never really wanted for anything. There was, there was, you know, in those days, people didn't have much anyway. And we didn't really want much because there wasn't much to have, was there? Do you know what I mean? Well, you wouldn't remember, you know, that, you know, that old. But um, it was kind of, so it was, it was nice. It was lovely. And then when it came time to when I was a teenager, when you started to want to, you know, you saw David Bowie on TV, so you wanted a bit of that. And so you wanted to buy your own clothes. And, um, but because, because we couldn't afford, my mom, my family couldn't afford to keep us in clothes or anything. So I had to get a job. And I, I think I used to sell raffle tickets, but my first proper job um, as when I, was about, when I was about 14 was as a window cleaner. So I used to walk around the council estates, the scheme they called it up there, um, with a wooden, with a heavy wooden double ladder and a bucket and a chamois newspaper, vinegar, the whole thing. And I used to clean windows. And I did that for, I don't know how long it was. Probably wasn't that long, but it <laughs> felt like a lot of time. But, um, and I can still take you, I can still take my mum mentally around who lived where in the streets around there because we'll have arguments about and i'll say no no she didn't live there she lived there because i used to clean her windows i can still remember that so that was kind of so i wasn't um i wasn't shy about hard work and then i went out I, in, the, in the school holidays i worked in a jeans factory i worked in a sock factory and actually funnily enough i put on the telly the other night and you know that tv show um about they have different factories yeah well, it was the, I think it was the company that I used to work in, their sock factory, but it was a different branch and it kind of brought back so many memories to me. God, I, I absolutely hated that job. It was awful in a boiling hot factory in the dye house. And um, so then I, the afterwards, I went to, um, so I'm rabbiting on now. I went to teach a training college because for some reason, um, I don't know how it came about. I thought I might be a teacher and I did really well at school and then when I got to teach the training college I absolutely hated it I couldn't stand it and I'd been in school for too long and I just wanted my independence and my friends owned a hairdressing salon uh, uh, like a, a diner sort of American hamburger diner place this was the mid 70s by then an American diner place and a, a disco. It was kind of all in one building. So I went off and kind of helped them just, just at the weekends. And, 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 and they had a hairdressing salon attached. And uh, it sounds awful, but actually it was all pretty cool. And um, I, I just 
I would work for them at the weekends, driving the vans, doing whatever, cleaning, da da da. And then I, I kind of fell into the hairdressing salon at the weekends and actually really enjoyed that. Then cut to a couple of years later, um, sort of after working in a few salons in London, I ended up at a place called Molten Brand, which you probably know as hand wash, yeah. but which in fact was the, the sort of coolest hairdresser salon in, yeah. in town in the 1970s. I actually walked past, I went for a walk in the West End a few weeks ago when it was empty and um, took a stroll down South Molten Street and uh, had a walk past and sort of down memory lane and they've still got the original windows on there. It was just, it was a really beautiful place to work and I learned so much. And while I was there, I got sent out on a photo shoot, which I'd never really kind of, I'd, I'd, I'd done the odd shoot for different things for the salon things, but I got sent out on a shoot for Vogue because I think somebody was, I think Kerry Warren was double booked or sick or something like that. So I, you know, as often happens, you kind of step into someone's shoes and, and you fill a gap and there's an opportunity for you. Yeah. And um, so I, I did that and they asked me to go back and I did a few shoots and I, over a, the course of a year or two, I built up a, a kind of, you know, a few clients where I would do photo shoots. Well, you know, it'd be Vogue one day, it'd be Free Men's Catalog the next day. It would yeah. be stuff like that. And, and I'd left the salon because I, 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 I think the light came on and I realised I'd found my spot. I had, because I'd always kind of, you know, when I came to London, you, there was Vogue magazine was around, and Harper's, Harper's Bazaar, all that kind of stuff. Harper's and Queen it was then. So you were kind of immersed in this, this world that was very sort of, very interesting, very creative and full of creative people. But it was completely different from, from it is now. The, the, the way it is now was not the way it was then. There were probably six magazines or, or probably maximum yeah, 10. Um, it wasn't a huge industry, it was, it was um, it was kind of niche. It was, fashion shows were, were, were for trade only. They weren't for the public. They, no, and, and the attendees at fashion show, the audience was journalists, yeah. um, fashion editors. Uh, it, it, was, it was very, very small. There weren't that many photographers. There, in fact, there weren't many photographers at all. That, and, and the journalists were not allowed to take pictures. They sometimes weren't even allowed to sketch. They certainly weren't allowed to talk about it for six months. It was very tight. But in the court, that, that would have been late 70s, early 80s. And then I, it, it, I have grown up with my industry. I, I was in the kind of at the beginning and I've been part of that sort of, um, God, I hate to use the word journey, but part of that sort of evolution of the kind of um, editorial, advertising, photo shoot, hairdresser. Because yeah. I remember when I first started, when I, I, I kind of thought, I, I, I remember the owner of Molten Brown took me to the side one day and said he wanted, it wasn't just me, there was a few of us, and he said, I don't want to, and, and Molten Brown at the time was the top session salon. It was, it was, that was the salon where magazines went to for hairdressers. Mm -hmm. Now, not many hairdressers, there weren't many hairdressers who didn't work in a salon because there wasn't that much editorial work. And I remember thinking, mm, I don't want to go back in there because he was, Michael was having too many people out the salon that he wasn't making money, obviously, yeah. you know? So, but I didn't see that at the time. That wasn't my problem. <laughs> so, um, of course I see it now and, and hats off to him. But um, I thought, no, I, I don't want to go back in the salon. I, I would have been happy to do half and half, but it was kind of an all or nothing thing when you're given a choice. Yeah. And I thought, well, I, do you know what? I'm going to give this a bash. And you know, when you're young, you kind of, um, you, you take risks, don't you? You, you, yeah. you, take, you take a lot of risks and, and, you know, rightly or wrongly and with great results or with not great results, I think, I think youth is 
it, it's such a great time to take risks, isn't it? It's such yeah. a, because you don't have any sense of the danger on the other side. Well, in my mind, I didn't anyway. I was all about the positive. I mean, I'm a very positive, I'm always kind of glass half full. Yeah. Well, you know what, if this doesn't work, I can always go back to the salon. The thing is, when, you, when you've when you learned to do hair and cut hair, you'll be fine, you know? Because I used, because there was like two or three lean years um, when I left the salon, we're like, oh shit, what am I gonna do for money? Because it's all very well working for Vogue, but you don't get paid, you know? Uh, so there's a few weeks where I used to drive around in my little mini and cut hair, you know, in people's houses, which a lot of us do, you know? And, I, and, and, I was, but, and funnily enough, I went for a walk down the river and ended up at Richmond a couple of weeks ago. And, um, I whole memory came back of I, I used to cut this lady's hair. Um, and I thought, oh my God, this is her house. I've just walked past her house. And she had, she had an amazing house just off the river in Richmond. And then I was Googling, and I'm sad that she's passed away. Uh, but, um, and I, I, you know, you look at things sometimes through rose tinted glasses, but they were, they were, they were good times because you meet some really fantastic, really wonderful people along, along the way. And a lot of those people I met in those years, I'm still friendly with to this day. In fact, I just had a conversation with one um, right now. That, what, was that 40 years we've known each other? Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a good old business to learn your trade because yeah. if all else fails, you can always, you'll always find something to do wherever you are in the world. You know, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's been very good to me. Yeah. I, I do you, I don't know about it. So I, you want me to stop talking now? No, no, no. I've just, I, was, I was just so intent listening. But I, going back to the beginning, you know, it's a, to, just some similarities. Like my, my dad was brought up on a farm in Perth in Scotland. Right. You know, and it was that. Uh, and, then, and then my nan, then they moved. He, he moved into a, it was farm people. So they moved him into a boffy uh, at 14. So literally I didn't have room for him in, in where they'd got moved to. And then he ended up, as soon as he got to 16, joining the army and he went to England and that. Right. Uh, and then we did, so that was that. But the, also then at, he used to do shift work and then he got a window cleaning round. So my first work was, <laughs> was I was, it? Help, yeah, yeah, swear yeah, to yeah. I was helping my That's dad funny. do window cleaning yeah. round. And yeah. then uh, I didn't think he was paying me enough. So right. I only had a little ladder. So I had to, the, the, locally there was a little estate and it was all bungalows. So I went and got my <laughs> own ground, you know. <laughs> so as you was talking, I said, you know, because I'm only like, yeah. I'm only a little bit behind you on, on, on that, where we started. And then, so I, you know, then, um, um, yeah, I mean, carrying that ladder around in, in I mean, in a cold, wintry day is uh yeah it's not that that's definitely an incentive to move on isn't it yeah yeah <laughs> and he was being a scot he was uh not afraid of some bad weather so he, he dragged me out you know there'd be icicles <laughs> off the windsail, you know and i was forever feeling sorry for myself oh god i've got really soft in my old age i mean it, yeah. it was raining yesterday and i didn't go for my walk yesterday and i thought what am i thinking about you know yeah, it's just water <laughs> what am i thinking about <laughs> And then, uh, and you say about Morton Brown, I, I went into hairdressing in 78, I started, and I worked for a, an Essex hairdressers for five years, then I went freelance for five years, and then you talk about uh, us taking risks, um, so like 10 years on, so I was 25, I sold my house, I was married and divorced by then, and I sold my house and bought uh, an empty unit and set up my own salon, you know, and it was like, I, I wouldn't dream of doing anything like that no, now. No. But you just, it's just going ho, isn't it? To, oh, yeah. I want my own place. I bought, the, I bought that. But I remember going up to Moulton Brown because they was the first ones to develop the bendy rollers. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 From the salon. So I yeah. remember going up to London and getting, yeah. getting those bendy rollers. I'd done, I'd done many a spiral perm on them. <laughs> But going back to your work, I mean, it it started with when I see the work. Looking back at your work, at the it was those those memorable uh, models that you worked on, of the the first of the supermodels, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. 
and it's some, some amazing names you've worked with. Mm. Well, that was, that, I mean, just after Malt Brand, after I went freelance, after, after the drive around in my mini sort of early 80s, 82, I, I'd been working quite a bit for, for British Vogue and two lovely ladies there, Anna Harvey, who's passed away, and Lister Barris, who's passed away too, um, were really, really helped me out at the beginning, you know, because I was just some kid, you know, and, and, um, and uh, but, so they were really kind, and you never forget that. You never, ever forget that. And it was really sad when, when Anna passed away a couple of years ago. She, she, cause Anna became Princess Diana's, um, sort of secret behind the scenes stylist and, and Anna, it was Anna that introduced me to Princess Diana later on. And, um, and we, we were, we, I mean, I saw her not so long ago and it was, it's just, it, I, I think what's really important in my life has been the relationships I've built with people. Cause you kind of, you realize as you get older that a lot of the relationships you form when you were young, many, 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 in my case, have lasted, you know, 40 odd years, you know, and it, that, that, that's kind of, that's very, um, kind of gives you confidence in people, doesn't it? It kind of, it, it's quite, um, it's quite, how would you, what's the word you would use? It's quite comforting as well. So you got, you definitely got people you can turn to, you know, and I think, I think it's really important in this business about, it's building relationships, isn't it? Like, like, like I was saying, after Martin Brown and after the, um, the freelance stuff in London, I started working a bit in New York in 82, because New York was the kind of center of the universe as far as that was concerned, because there wasn't really an industry in London. It was very small. It was a much bigger industry in New York. And off I trotted to New York, again, taking the huge risk. And um, so they thought I'll go to New York for six weeks and ended up there for, you know, on and off for 20 years. Um, because it was kind of, it was, it was 82. Now I built up, by 85, I built up a very good relationship with American Vogue and lots of the photographers there. And these young girls started to come because we, we were working with with models like brooke shields and and um um oh god christy brinkley and but they were girls from the 70s so the things were changing and by the mid 80s these young girls called christy turlington linda evangelista and naomi campbell yeah. um were kind of coming on go-sees and you'd see these young girls in a track. And there, there, was a, there was obviously a sea change happening and you, you kind of can feel that. And I, although I'm 10 years older than them, we were all still young. So yeah. I, we all kind of grew up together yeah. through that sort of mid eighties, nineties yeah. thing. I mean, I remember Naomi coming on a, a go-see off the bus from Streatham and we were, we were doing a shoot for, Harper's on, uh, what's that, uh, the Albert Memorial across from the Albert Hall. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. And um, she came with the little ribbons in her hair. Now, oh, my mum doesn't know I'm modeling, did it? I'm coming on to go see it. And, and, um, and she was just a, this extraordinary thing with these long limbs and really cute and funny. And, uh, yeah. and actually I was watching one of her videos today and still this, I can still hear the same voice, it's quite funny. She's still got that thing. And so, so I knew those girls. I don't know, I didn't meet those girls as these icons. I watched those girls become that, you, you know, that, that wasn't, that wasn't, it wasn't overnight for them. It was, it was a few years process, you know, it was kind of a, it was a, it was a timing as well. Cause I think I, I've been lucky in my working life to have had sometimes really good timing to be in a rap listen this this whole pandemic thing going on i have conversations with people in my age and we, we were saying the other day oh my god I'm so, I'm so glad we have lived through the decades we have lived because it's yeah. just been incredible for for music for fashion we've yeah. we've not had uh we've not had a war we've not had a bad this is the worst yeah thing that's ever happened you know i mean the aids in the 80s was 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 yeah. really bad but this is this is sort of 
it's certainly the weirdest thing and the repercussions are probably going to go on for a long time but boy have we lived through some amazing times through the 60s and 70s and, and, and all that stuff so watching these girls grow up and go through the so watching the whole phenomenon kind of um grow really and happen it, 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 so to me they were never they were never what what people see them as i th that that happened to them does that make sense yeah of course yeah. And, and with kate too the same thing with kate came along kate came along after that and they kind of and lo and behold she went on to be bigger than any of them so it's just yeah it's quite interesting looking back yeah i don't look back too much though no no it's just something that i think that things like this make you do it don't they you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you. They, def they definitely make you kind of assess things and reassess things and, yeah and and definitely make you think and they give you well this what it's done for me is given me an opportunity to stand still and actually kind of look at myself because I, I think probably mentally really if you really think about it because i haven't stopped traveling for 40 years till now yeah and, and working you know really really crazy travel and work and this has given me time to reflect i suppose and think okay what well, what do i want for the for the next bit so i'm not sure i want to continue doing that as much you know i i because actually having time to myself and because you you actually it becomes quite addictive and you kind of you, this has only dawned on me in the last few months it became it's become you, you realize you're quite you kind of addicted to that way of life yeah and you kind of are probably running away from yourself a bit so you don't have to face yourself or face think not not in a bad way just in a kind of you know moving on to the next thing so you don't have to deal with the last thing which is very comfortable and very easy but but i've been kind of forced to actually face that and think well okay um because at first i thought oh this is great i'm in my garden i never get time to do anything like this i'm not gonna I don't have to go to work and then and, then, and, I, and I thought oh god I'm ready for retirement but after a couple of months I go, well I'm actually no I'm not ready for retirement no, at it's all. Off. you know I've, got, <laughs> I've still got a lot to do but um but maybe not exactly the same as I was doing before it's definitely given me time to think about things I think many so many people I've spoken to have had that same thing yeah and I equate it to the, the hamster wheel that even if it's a good hamster wheel or a bad one yeah when you're on it you just keep moving and you but i have to say that the last couple of years i i had felt the hamster wheel thing I, I kept saying now much as though i love what i'm doing a lot of this is just repetition you know and i feel that if i've got what 10 or 20 years left i don't want to i don't want to be pressing the repeat button i want to take another risk <laughs> you know yeah. i'm ready for another risk <laughs> ready for a risk i'm ready for a risk <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready for an adventure. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, if things come into your mind of the possibilities of yes, a few well, things. Yeah. I'm work, that's what I'm working on now. So yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, so I'll, let's I'll, see. Yeah. I'm going to give it. I've got time. You know, I, yeah. I've, I've got time on my hands, which I've I've never had before. And really, it's and you know what? I've got my house. I've got my garden. Yeah. I got my health. Touch wood. I had the virus in April at the beginning, and I had it very very mildly. Right. So you know. I'm I'm lucky, um, and I will get the vaccine. I, yeah. I I'm not I can't get the first one because I have a severe allergy to nuts. So so I carry an EpiPen, so I'm not allowed to have the first one. Right. Uh, so I'll get the the one that's come out now. So and I think I'm due to get that in May if I'm on the list properly. Yeah. So um, um, I wear a mask. I don't go around too many people. You know, I'm trying to trying to keep it going and be sensible and and yeah. and uh be, be kind of thinking of other people too i mean it kind of drives me mad with the, the um the, the the carelessness of some people obviously not yeah. everyone, of most people actually most people have been great you know i, I think the majority but then yeah yeah I think it's just that the selfishness of the of the few does stand yeah. out so much it's true and I, and it's I true yeah. more so since this this has become even more serious yeah, uh, and we're all hearing. I think everyone I've spoken to now knows of a, 
a lot of people have got it. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's changed now, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's that little, and it's really has increased in tempo and and, and people. Are well, really I'm quite. I, I see. I had no symptoms. This, this was in April. I had no symptoms at all, and until I said to someone, I was on my own, and I said to someone on the phone, on, one of my team used to, because I, I was, I'd been in Paris, so I isolated for two weeks. I actually isolated for three weeks, just yeah. in case. Yeah. But one of my team would drop some groceries off on a Saturday for me. I, I wasn't even going to the shop, nothing. No. So, and he lives down the road, so he'd come and drop, and every week he'd say, God, you've lost a bit of weight. And I said, you know what, my, my the food doesn't taste of it. My food doesn't taste of anything. And then he said, go and stick your nose in a scented candle or in something smelly, which I did. Oh my God, I can't smell anything. So I had been, I, I had been asymptomatic pretty much, not knowing it for a couple of weeks probably. So I'm really aware, I mean, from personal experience, that you really can be spreading it and not know it. But I think a lot of people are still blissfully unaware of that. You know, my my uh, my daughter, one of my daughters. I've got five five kids and four oh, wow. grandchildren. So I've been busy. <laughs> but I've got uh, we've we've actually got a new I've got a new grandson that came this weekend because we're all living in the same house and she had a home birth. So we've had a we had a thirty six hour home oh birth. Oh my god! So we've all got a bit dark eyes, and <laughs> so we may get a bit of crying in a minute. But uh, my mum, my mum's age. And when was that? This 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 was on Monday. Oh my god! <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> yeah, oh, it's it, 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 the, the most wonderful experience. This home, right. and, and it, it, the fact that she didn't have to go in the hospital, which is awful at the moment, that yeah. we could all be with her. You know, so yeah. there was there was four of us with her, and you know, and the others was hiding. But it was amazing, mate. And, and the midwives, the, you know, and the NHS, you you just can't sound up about them. At the I know. Moment, you know. Wow. Which, they're just they are angels. I I I kind of I wish I I wish that the government would stop all this sort of encouraging people to clap and all that kind of stuff and actually give them what give them some money and treat them properly because the, the the applause is somehow this time really empty because yeah. The, 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 the government needs to step up. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous, you know, it's it, ridiculous. It's very poor and it, it, it's, it's, no, it's beyond poor. It's, it's despicable now with, with the things. It is. The, the, the children's, this latest fiasco of the children's. Oh, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's hard, it's hard to believe that constantly there's something else, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you think, yeah. And as well, you even think from a PR point of view, some of these things you think, even if you don't mean it, you really should think about this. Look at because you, you you know it just it, it, even if it's an empty thing, it looks so bad. Yeah. You know, like people in this position, how can you make these silly mistakes? But yeah, beyond my pay grade. I know. I know. I, know. <laughs> I can't. But you said about the virus, like my my mum's eighty four, and she. Um, her friend, uh, uh, fella, <laughs> he, uh, oh, she'd kill me if I say that. <laughs> her fella, <laughs> you, just, you just said it. I just said it. Um, he got it. He, he got it on the, the same time as you got it. And, and he's, not, he's 80, he's 85. Yeah. And, um, he went in and, and, um, he literally like so lucky to be alive, you know? So that's yeah. why I find it hard to listen to this, this stuff. And, and, uh, and you know, right. the other thing I've got is is I've got a lot of I've got a twenty year old son who's a hairdresser, uh, twenty so he's twenty four. So I've got a few that are in their early twenties, who oh, it, it's quite a job to keep them in, <laughs> you know, because uh, you, you think well, I didn't catch that. That's that's my watch. It, it's like I'm not. It's easy for me not to go anywhere because <laughs> I don't go far. But for them, you know, it's it's hard to. to it's a real balancing act to be, be okay with what they're doing, you know. Um, I've got to go back. I'm really sorry, like, because you did right. say about this, and I've, I've got to go back because you, 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 you hit on the point where you did Diana's hair, and I've seen, yeah. I've seen the pictures. And it, 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 what was it like at the time for you? Because as you said, things were not 
but when they had well, to, I mean, I I'd, I'd had a this was 1919 by then. I'd, I'd had like 12, 13 years of quite a successful career, and I, I was kind of at the top yeah. of my game, really. And yeah. I was in that whole supermodel, yeah, whatever era, and things were going really well. And then when I met Diana, um, I managed to some, and I was spending a lot of time traveling, but I managed to spend, I managed to work it out so that I would cut her hair and look after it when I was in London. And then we got a couple of lovely girls from Daniel Galvin to take over and Daniel would color it. So, so I kind of looked after her, you know? Yeah. And then I'd do all the photo shoots and, and, um, so we, we somehow made that work. And, um, she was amazing though. She was, I mean, she was, she had that talent like you've got that I don't have naturally. Do you know, she had that, that, um, not that I'm not compassionate, but she was a natural, I mean, I went to places like Mother Teresa's in Calcutta with her and, and I'd be the one that was sort of in tears around the back of the van because I couldn't really cope with what was going on, but yeah. she would be just, she'd be just off hugging all the lepers and, and not, not, not phased one bit. And then when you slow, so, slowly saw the magic, I mean, it was magic, it was kind of, she had such an amazing charisma and she knew it. She, I think she, by then she had started to discover what she was good at. Yeah. And that's what she was good at. We went to, I remember one time we went up to Pakistan, up in the border of Afghanistan. And I mean, you couldn't really go there. I mean, doubt you can go there at all now. And one of the newsreaders, I can't remember which one it was. I need to Google that. I need to get more info on that. One of the newsreaders at the time had started this charity. Um, he had built a limb fitting center. Like, you know, these refugee camps were just going on for miles. And, and the, the, the Russians had planted bombs in kids' toys like fire engines, little fire engines and things. So there's all these kids with no arms and no legs because they wanted to, they wanted to, they, they wanted to um, destroy the youth so that they couldn't have an army. You know, all that kind of stuff. And um, so there's all these kids with no arms. So this guy's to set up a limb fitting center. So she went off to publicize that and she took us with her. And I, I was thinking, what's she taking us with us to, the, to this thing for this not i've got nothing to do but she just wanted us to see what was going on with what she did which was kind of amazing and it wasn't a big entourage it was only a couple of us and um i mean the, it was just it was extraordinary and she knew she could bring attention and she had no she was not phased at all there was not you know we were all in the back sort of tears rolling down our because it was really sad of course it was awful but she was just Waded through, hugging everyone, not a, not a, sort of, not a giveaway tear in her eye, and because that that wasn't her mentality. She was a, she was a natural nurse, really, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, she was brilliant with people. She was just amazing, and people felt it. It was genuine. It wasn't some PR stunt. Yeah. Because she did loads of things. She did loads of things with homeless people. Yeah. I, you know, she took a lot of risks, and I'd say to her sometimes, you know what. I know you want to go there on your own, but I'm not sure yeah. it's the best idea because someone just, some one person, oh, they, won't, they won't, it's fine. And if you do, then whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and that's about taking risks, isn't it? But she was, she, she was a natural. She knew that was her call, really, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I think that left a huge impression on me. That was really incredible. It was amazing. But you have that similar thing. You, you, that, what, when I see what you do, yeah. it's a similar, it's a, it's a similar, would you say talent or a similar sort of part of you? I think, yeah, it's, um, it, it maybe it's just a natural empathy that, yeah, got, you know, that, but that it's not just empathy. It goes way beyond that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, um, I think just my, my, as opposed to hers, mine was purely because I relate so well to them because being, you know, like I'm in April, I'm 15 years sober and I was really at a bad point. And so with these guys, when I talk to them, I, I, I really get where they're right. coming from. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. You know, I do know I was like a whisper away from, but you know, losing it. Right. I was, okay. I, you know, I've got a family just, and I, I kept my business at the time. Like, 
the, the addictions didn't take my business away. The landlord did in 2018, you know, like, um, so it was, yeah, I, I, that's where I just, I just relate to them, you know, when I, I, I just feel, I feel right around them. And I think that's, she did, didn't she? She didn't. She did because she, she had this, I mean, the first time I met her, she, she we were in a studio in Hackney Road. Um, and um, we didn't even know it was her that was coming. We had a few people were doing that day for Vogue. And anyway, this sort of tall, blonde, leggy thing come le- running up the stairs, laughing, hands outstretched. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't. Totally disarming. And that, but that was natural. And that's how and she, she kind of harnessed the power of that. And she would, she would just be so... Um, the, 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 the perceived barrier would just melt in, in, a, in a half a second. So, so people were, she was totally easy. With, so people were totally easy with her. And she could say things and talk to them on a very, very normal level. And if you, if you notice, she was the first one of the royal people that actually got down on the floor with people and got down yeah. and touched people and hugged people and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So, so it was a kind of, um, yeah, it was, it was an amazing thing to watch. Yeah. And then I understood what she did for a living, that she wasn't this, she wasn't this sort of, um, you know, this lofty in, her, in an ivory tower princess. She actually grafted and, and, and oh. meant it, you know. There's another thing about, was I said to her once, she was going on trip, I said, you know what, don't have your hair done. She, she did her own makeup. She didn't really do much of the hair, right? but don't, don't get all glammed up. She, 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 the thing is, she said, the, uh, if I'm going to these people, they don't want to see me coming out of the gym with sort of straggly hair and, and trainers on. They want to see Princess Diana. So that's my role. And, and, and I totally got that. She had, a, she had a very strong sense of what she was doing. And, uh, you yeah. uh, know. When it really struck me was the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. Because when yeah, that was first hit, and this, and this, you was around at that time, you don't know that the stigma yeah. that came yeah. with it. Yeah, it she did a lot to break that down. Yeah, she really did, and and she people really didn't want to touch people, wouldn't they? There was that. It was that bad. Yeah, yeah. You know, and she was in there, wasn't she? And she was in, in uh, you know, hugging, as you say, hugging people, holding their hands, and that, and that's such a strong, powerful message to people that you know. Mm. These, these are everyday people suffering, you know, that was incredible. Um, I, got I mean, for me, what I, what I take away from that is, is that uh, all these people that we're talking about, including Donna, I've met through my job. If I hadn't fallen into doing hair, I wouldn't have met those people. You know what I mean? I mean, I didn't met other people, of course, but my life would have been very different. I, I think the opportunities that kind of arise from doing this work can be quite sort of unexpected, you know? Yeah. And, but, but then that's, that's about take, I mean, that's about actually taking those opportunities though, isn't it? And not, not shying away from them. That, that's another thing. It's these crossroads moments. It's a bit yeah. of mine that, you know, yeah. they're often these crossroads moments that we, we you know, sliding doors moments and, you know, yeah. it, it, and as you said, as you're younger, you you just tend to just jump on them, didn't you? <laughs> you do. You do get you do. I've kind of I've, I've probably done that all my life. Yeah. Um, really, I mean, I've taken opportunities, but I think, I think, I, I I'm trying to look at this pandemic as another opportunity and thinking, okay, yeah. this is time to maybe move on and try something more. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Let's just see what happens. I think <laughs> the, the, the great thing as well for this is, is why it's so important for you uh, to be out there, to tell people about this stuff, is to, is to remind people what a great industry this is. It's true, isn't it? Because, you know, I, I've done a few of these and sometimes, oh, God, I'm fed up talking about myself. But then it is important to, to, to give people some kind of hope and some kind of, because this industry really has, it's brought me a lot of happiness. I mean, a lot of happiness and, and still does. And I think it's been kind of, it's been hard for a lot of the hair industry. And all my, my friends were salons and things. It's really, really tragic. It's, it's awful. And, and, and 
and you watch them and you think, oh God, because well, there's no end to it. There's, the, there's, there's it, it seems to be ongoing, but it will end. It yeah. will end as soon as we get these vaccines on the road. In a couple of months, we'll be we'll start getting back to some kind of normality. You know? Yeah, it, it's got to be. I think. I'm a, 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 and while we're on that, while we're on our soapbox, it's. I think it's another crucial thing that the government look at dropping the VAT rate. Um, Oh, absolutely. Because Mill, yeah. Millie's on, on the case with that, though, isn't she? Right, well, I'm, I'm Millie, right. These guys have been amazing at, um, at, the, at the British Beauty Council, too, haven't they? They're, and, yeah. and Sonia at the Telegraph. It's, quite, it's, it's really lovely to see people coming together. I just think it's such a great industry. It's got great people in it. And yes, a lot of the people in it are incredibly creative, and they will find creative ways to come, to come through this. But I, I, I'd like to... It gets a bad rap sometimes, hairdressing, isn't it? Sometimes it's the, it's the thing you send your kids to do if they can't do anything else. And it's still a bit like that. I like to think it's not, it's not as bad as it was when I was younger, but it still has that, um, that kind of connotation about it. And, and anything we can do to change that, because it's, it's a great trade to learn. Yeah. You can make a lot of money, you can make a lot of friends, you can have a lot of fun, you know? And um, it, once you've learned a skill like that, you, it's like riding a bike, you never lose it, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's, it's, I'm so grateful to it, you know, and as I said, like, um, end of 2018, I'd had to sell them for 30 years, and it was just, you know, like so many, what people are going through now with their businesses is sort of, I, I, I got it two years earlier with the, the high street and the rents and things, and it wiped me out, you know, like he doubled the rent, there was no leeway, and we just, it was already struggling a bit, and it just, it, it finished See, it. I don't understand what's going on with this, because a, a friend of mine had a really amazing little flower stand outside the tube station near my house. Really lovely, busy, da, da, da. and he had to close it, because there were, there were, the rents and rates were going, this is a couple of years ago, yeah. the rents and rates were sky high. So now, it sat there, empty for two years so they're not getting anything from it no you know i mean it doesn't it doesn't make any sense what's is that what's going to happen to the high street I, I, they're going to have to make give incentives to people to 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 revitalize it no yeah they, they've got to look at it. i i definitely the the vet has got to change because it's not it, it's not a workable um uh, state as it is at the moment um and then they've got to, yeah, they've got to, the landlords have got to look at this. I mean, mine's, I'm, mine stayed empty for nearly a year, I think. Yeah. And then it became a vape shop or something. I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, like, well, they, they, at the tube station, they've, they've shut that and they've shut the little um, newspaper and, um, you know, confectionery stand. That's yeah. gone. That, that's empty. So they're just boarded up. Would it, yeah, well, wouldn't it be better having some kind of little business yeah. in there who yeah. could afford to be there, you know, yeah. rather than nothing? It, you know, and it, it, it was 30 years of my life. Wow. <laughs> it was like, like a biggest bereavement. But what hairdressing still saved me because going through that, I was at such a low ebb. But then I would drive out to a, a, um, a Salvation Army in Ipswich or somewhere, talk to a young guy who's the same age as my son, who lives in a tent. He's got nothing, no family. Nothing. And how, how did you start doing that, Stephen? Uh, it was in um, 2014. I saw Mark Bustos, who was the guy in New York who does it on the streets. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I thought, That's fantastic. And I was already going down the South Sally Army in Romford, because I live in, near Romford. I was going down there every Monday to just talk to people about alcohol and, and you know, helping people with addictions and things. So I thought next week, I saw this Facebook thing, and I thought, I've got to take my scissors, because the guys used to come in for lunch. And I'll go an hour early and I'll do a couple of haircuts. And it was so, it just, I fell in love with hairdressing again, Sam. Right. So yeah. like, it was that pure exchange of someone feeling better about himself, you know, and there was no ulterior motive, there was no money exchanging hands. It was just purely like, come here, mate, I'll make you feel better, you know. And, and, and then I loved it so much, I thought, right, I'm going to come every week and do a few really quickly. If you, I stuck some pictures on, so a few mates said, I will come and help. Then a few other places said, can you come to us? And before I knew it, and the hairdressing industry has been, has been amazing with it because 
you know, I've had I've had Neil Moody, I've, I've had Adam Reed, I've had also I'll have, I'll have you in the future because <laughs> um, I've all come. Uh, uh, Millie has been to the Whitechapel. Yeah, recently. I saw, I saw you see that either on the Clifford's, you know, like it's <laughs> you know that. But the, as I say, such a giving, wonderful community that we're in, you know, and it's 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 built on. Uh, an army of volunteers now we've got over 600 and before covid we'd hit 67 sites across the uk and ireland you know so and how uh, how uh, are they permanent sites or, or what what do you what do you uh, do yeah what we do so we latch onto a place so what we'll you know like we've got the Whitechapel mission say uh, once we establish that we can come and work there we'll say look we'll be here every, the first monday of every month and then all we asked of our, our volunteers is only half a day once a month, so we don't impose. So it's quite doable, you know, uh, and they know then that they're going there the first Monday and the one in, the one in Birmingham is the first Tuesday of the month, you know, and it, so it's a consistent thing and the guys going get to rely on us and, and it, the consistency is important because it's all about trust because the most important thing in a salon and if you're going, if you what you, what you do as well, you know, is that initial um, consultation is key, you know, yeah. so that where you, you build that instant rapport with someone um, and trust is so important with people who are very untrusting, you know, right. that, that they've got a lot of reason not to trust. And so for us to then... And it, is it mostly men or is there women there as well? Mostly men, yeah, yeah. yeah most of the places. However, we've, we've, over the years, we've made new roads into doing a lot of stuff for uh, women's refuges and things like that. So you won't see that so much because that's that's obviously a lot of that's off camera. And yeah, 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 yeah. Places. Yeah. But they're, they're so rewarding because yeah. some of these women, are, uh, the, the stories, you know, uh, is horrendous. And, and, and you see them. There's a lovely image on one of our things. It's my sister who's worked with me all these years holding a woman's hand and I'm cutting her hair. Yeah. This young girl took her, we was there for two hours, it was right nearly at the end that she could actually come into the room. And my sister held her hand the whole time I cut her hair. And I've done a banging haircut, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but she she had this lovely thick hair and had a right nice fridge. But she, um, she and, and the women working there said, we, we didn't think she'd come in. She's been, and they hinted at what it, you know, that, yeah. you know terrible time the girl had had you know and, you know but then people think this is the only time you people are getting that in their salons as well this is the wonderful thing about hairdressing there's people coming in your salon sitting in your chair and you don't you you know they come in a certain way you know they go out elevated you don't know you know some of these women you know are, it's an amazing industry we're in i can't sorry I'll, <laughs> no it is no no of, of course it is yeah well, it's like it's like us doing photo shoots. So the, yeah. I was trying to explain to someone once. It's it's um, for instance, Kate Moss. Um, I think we were, we were on a shoot once, and the editor was saying, "How come it takes? How come it's taking two hours for hair and makeup and to get dressed?" And I thought, "Okay, it's six o'clock in the morning. These girls don't just get out of bed and get on the set, and that's them. That image you see is not really them. It's it's makeup." hair, clothes, shoes that don't fit, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's about, it's about spending an hour and a half or two hours getting, getting, building a character in the dressing room. Yeah. I don't allow uh, cameras in the dressing room when we're in there and they can come in for five minutes because these days a lot of people want to film in the dressing room like, no, this is, this doesn't belong anywhere. It's here because yeah. They'll unload to us, we'll unload to them. You know, it's early in the morning, it's bare-faced. Everyone's yeah. still looking and feeling hideous. And, uh, and, um, yeah. and trying to get a cup of tea and a bacon sandwich down, or, you know what I mean, so before we start the long day. And because it's, the hair thing is like, it, it's like an armor. It, it's like, it's also like, it's, it's a protection. It's all those kind of things. So, just, just getting your hair done or changing your hair, I know, gives people a, a whole different level of confidence. Yeah. And it takes that hour and a half or two hours with makeup and everything for even those actresses and supermodels or whatever to 
build that confidence to go and have the lights and the camera action and get into a day's work. And it's the same for real people. It's exactly the same process in a different way. You know, it's the same basic instinct. Yeah, of course. It, you, you know what I mean? It's, it's sort of, it's, you, you can see, you can see when you've, um, when you, I cut, I, 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 we, I cut, it was my first job after lockdown. Uh, there was a, a little budding pop star called Sodi, and she's really lovely. She had long, thick, long hair, and her agent said, would I cut her hair? Da, 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 da. So we razored it all off into this sort of little choppy sort of thing. And uh, she left me, this, this was in the summer, and she left me a message the other day on Instagram saying, oh my God, this is the best thing I have ever done. It's made me so happy. And that filled me with such joy. You know, it's really, it's really lovely to hear that, just from a haircut. I, th I think I saw that. I think that was it really long, heavy hair, and then you yeah, it's really it. long, and then it was like a shag cut, was it? Sort of like no, no, that was something else. No, no, this oh, is right. a, I'll, I'll post it. Um, Sandra. no, she's a, she's she's a really good singer, and and uh, she's very sweet. She's at the beginning of the career, and they, they, I, I think they just wanted to lose the little schoolgirl long thick hair and become yeah. a bit stylish, and she just. And you know, you, you kind of, in those situations, I've never met her before and you think, oh God, um, I hope she's going to be all right with this because <laughs> it's, it's a huge change for her. But no, it was really, it was really nice to hear back from her months later how it changed her life. Because it, it does, it's, it, can be, it can be life enhancing and life changing, can't it? Yeah. It's important, it's important. It makes you feel good. Yeah. Even me with my little stubble <laughs> here, which I've been cutting myself, I, I'll do it this afternoon and it's, um, it feels really good to get it off. Do you know what I mean? I'll do it for you after lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? By the, thank you, but by this, by this time, I'm quite capable of doing it myself. <laughs> but I haven't got the patience to sit down and let someone do it. <laughs> oh, don't worry, I don't take long. <laughs> I'm right on with this anyway. Errol Douglas couldn't believe it. He <laughs> before Christmas and he, he was like, I was like lightning. I'm like, no. I, yeah. one thing I've learned is how to do it quickly. <laughs> um, well, just before we go, I, I've got to sort of mention your generosity because um, I've had a few people on the, on the podcast um, and they've said they got their start assisting you, you know. Yeah, there's, quite, there's quite a lot of them around now. I know, and that, but that was it. It was this thing. I know, oh yeah, and then I got my break because I assisted Sam at night and it kept coming and kept coming. And, you know, and I, I think you seem to be, you know, very generous with that. that, that, that and you're always championing your other head. Oh, I love it. When my, I'm, I, there's nothing pleases me more than when my team are doing really well. I mean, Nicola Clark was 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 my first assistant for years and i'd still see nicola to this day there's a lot of them out there that have been on my team and i love it when they do well i, I i'm well i got a box of biscuits from one yesterday who, who left last year and he's doing he's doing all the celebs on his own and he's doing really well and i got a box of biscuits with thank you written on them and stuff and i mean that's just really fantastic to, to hear that yeah. i'm a great champion for good kids who to, to do well do you know what i mean i'm really nothing makes me happier than seeing them doing well well, I can't thank you enough um, for your time. When f this is over, I want to have a cup of tea with you one. Yeah, no, that's great. I'd love that. That's really good. To, I want you to sign <laughs> my book. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and uh, I, I'll bring my son with me, if you don't mind, because, um, you know, yeah, he's uh, 25 years old. and uh, Yeah. It, it, well, I've just planted a few thousand chilies, so you can come around and have a cup of tea in the garden when they're out. Amazing. I, there you go. Just, and we can, we can discuss things further. Yeah. But I, I thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I've loved thank it. Thank you. That was good. I enjoyed thank that. You. Thank you.